It's now a pleasure to introduce uh, the, the fourth speaker, and uh, it's Stephanie Allard, who is uh, the administrator here at the uh, Detroit Center for Animal Welfare, and so along with Ron Kagan is our host in, uh, of this uh, great conference. And, and uh, she is uh, the um, increasing, in one of an increasing number of PhDs who's went straight from academics into a zoo career and has been working on a zoo, in zoo-based research and zoo animal welfare uh, for uh, uh, um, the last 15 years. Her talk today is on personality in turtles. Stephanie. Thank you. Obviously, I started working when I was 10. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for being here. I, I do have to reveal just one tiny disappointment, uh, and that is that for those of you who have traveled from warmer climates, that you didn't perhaps bring some of that along with you, but we'll let it go. So when I was putting this talk together, I actually had originally put a question mark um, at the end of the title, personality in turtles, question mark. I'm going to share with you some preliminary results of a study that we've been working on here at the Detroit Zoo. And, uh, and I did remove the question mark, partially because of the information I'm going to be sharing with you, but also because as someone who has worked with turtles for a great number of years, I can tell you anecdotally that there is no question mark at the end of that title. Um, so without further uh, delay, I will get started. So when we are talking about animal personality, we are referring to the fact that individuals do exhibit um, relatively stable and consistent differences in their behavior across multiple contexts and across time. And these differences in behavior are referred to as personality traits. Now, this has been studied in a very broad range of species, uh, in a lot of different mammals, birds, fish, reptiles, amphibians, and even vertebrates. Now, one of the most widely accepted and used uh, approaches to studying personality in humans, for example, is the five-factor model. And this has also been used in animals to look for personality evidence. Uh, three of these bipolar factors, if you will, do seem to be fairly consistently evident in a wide variety of species. Namely, those are neuroticism, uh, being agreeable, and then uh, being an extrovert or the extroversion factor. However, as the research um, has been building over the last several decades, a large number of traits have been identified in, in many species, including aggressiveness, boldness, exploration, fearfulness, and sociability. Now, it's also been discovered that some of these behavioral traits or these personality traits are correlated with each other, and these groups of, of traits are, are called behavioral syndromes. For example, um, aggressiveness and boldness syndrome uh, is an example where individuals that are more aggressive uh, would also tend to be more bold in response to pre predators, for example, uh, when compared to less aggressive individuals. So, so you do tend to see some of these traits to be uh, present together across these different contexts. So when we're studying animal personalities, uh, there are a number of different methodologies that are used. One can be really as simple as simply observing individual animals within their home environments uh, or during interactions with familiar conspecifics, very basic type of work. But very often, it involves measuring an individual's response to some kind of novelty, whether it be an environment, uh, stimulus, or conspecifics, for example, uh, or also known stressors. The open field test, for example, um, has been used widely to look for traits such as exploration, boldness, and activity levels. This is where an animal is placed into a novel open test area, if you will, and its behavior is studied uh, in response to that. The use of questionnaires is also being used fairly widely at this point to look for personality evidence. This is where you would have a human observer rate personality traits for animals that they are familiar with, and those traits are then uh, looked at for consistency. Often these measures can be used together, which also, of course, increases the validity. This research is, is growing, certainly, in the zoo world, uh, which is a wonderful thing to see. And to give you a few examples, uh, Carlstead and colleagues, uh, about 15 years ago, did uh, a great study looking at a, a multi 
uh, faceted approach to looking for personality traits in rhinoceros. And they looked at both keeper ratings and uh, response to a novel test, novelty test, to see whether or not there were uh, correlations between those, and they did find them. Uh, in a study that was actually uh, originally looked at um, by Gold and Maple, uh, the Gorilla Behavior Index was um, identified, and, uh, and there was a, a correspondence between both affiliative and aggressive behavior and this uh, behavior index, or, or personality, if you will, measures uh, for captive male gorillas. This was then uh, reproduced by Kuhar et al. Uh, less than 10 years ago. One other interesting area uh, in which this research has been used is as a tool to try to improve things like breeding success and captive management, which is a really exciting area of work. Now, personality can have really important evolutionary and ecological implications, as traits have been linked to various factors that can impact individual fitness. For example, animals that are bolder may have increased reproductive rates. However, there is also a trade-off in those individuals, as they may have decreased survival. Um, individuals that show higher rates of exploration would uh, also show increases in reproductive uh, success. And finally, there's been evidence showing that animals that are more aggressive actually show both improved reproductive success and survival rates. So one of the things that <clears throat> really interested us when we were starting to think about this study is the fact that personal personality can also have implications within conservation contexts. For example, personality traits were found to impact how individual Stevens kangaroo rats reacted to the stressors affiliated with translocation. And captive bred swift foxes that were more bold actually had decreased survival rates after reintroduction. So, as I said, this is what kind of brought us to thinking about doing this study, and uh, the reason being that zoos really are concerned with both animal welfare and conservation. We can all attest to that in this room. However, little emphasis has been placed on connecting these two fields in the, zool in the zoological context. One of the goals of the Center for Zoo Animal Welfare is to conduct applied animal welfare research, and we don't want that to be constrained simply to the animals that are living here uh, in our care. Ensuring that individual animal welfare is taken into consideration within conservation projects is a key component of our compassionate approach to conservation, and therefore a focus of some of the research we do at the center. You may be asking yourself, what is compassionate conservation? Not everyone is as familiar with the term uh, as we are here, but you're going to be hearing a lot more about it throughout the rest of this symposium, and there's an entire session tomorrow devoted to this very topic, which is very important to us. This is the concept that we have to take into consideration individual animal welfare within the context of conservation projects. Because if you're increasing individual welfare, it sort of goes along the fact that you're going to be increasing conservation outcomes. But also, we never want to forget that every individual is important, not just population or species level concerns. So the zoo has been involved in a head-starting program for Blanding's turtles, which is a species of special concern here in the state of Michigan, since 2011. The reason for this is that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service determined that there were very few young turtles, young small turtles. And it turns out it's because when um, they're young, they're small and potentially um, easy prey for predators, snack size, if you will. Um, and when female turtles are, are traveling to make their nests, they can travel up to a mile away from the water areas, which means that they may have to travel across roads, which of course can increase mortality. But also then their hatchlings have to make their way back to water, which uh, increases their risk for predation. One of the great parts of this collaboration is that once the turtles that are head started and therefore grown up here in a safe environment until they are a certain size, making them less prone to predation, they are then tracked by researchers from the University of Michigan Flint using GPS trackers, and they can follow their movements and therefore their survival rates uh, for up to two years after release. Part of this year's cohort that was released earlier this summer, uh, 24 of the turtles were GPS tracked, or they, they had GPS transmitters affixed to their shells, and we used these as our test studies uh, before they were released into the Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge. 
we conducted four variations of an open field test to assess their consistency of response across these different contexts. One is the basic open field where each turtle was placed into uh, a novel tank. Then we had a conspecific test where we placed a mirror in that tank to see what the turtle's response would be. We looked at their latency to acquire food within the open field, both without and then with a predator present, the predator being a toy raccoon, um, as that is, um, seems to be their, their number one predator in the wild. I'm not sure how um, scary he was. He was very cute. So each turtle was tested three times as we wanted to look for consistency across tests. And I do want to say that as the turtles were housed in group um, settings, we did only test one turtle per group per day as to not influence um, each turtle uh, individually as we were handling them. And then all testing sessions were video recorded so we could layer analyze them without influencing the behavior of the turtles. I'm going to report just some preliminary results, as I mentioned, for a subset of 10 turtles, where we looked strictly at their first trial for each of the four tests. So the basic open field, the mirror response, the food acquisition with and then without predator. Once we removed um, highly autocorrelated variables that we were looking at as far as our um, behavioral variables, our uh, principal component analysis did show that we had two separate components that emerged. And if you look uh, from the top going down, you do see that the first three variables are grouped together. And these were uh, variables that we measured during the basic open field test with, with no additions. And then the last uh, five measures are, are grouped together um, in, a, in a separate component. If you look at this graph, it does actually uh, seem to reveal that there may be individual variations in boldness levels. If we look at uh, each individual turtles, and you see at the bottom of the screen, I can do this. These are, are the, the 10 different turtles that we looked at during this uh, pilot phase. You can see that uh, the turtles that had lower latencies to perform behaviors were somewhat consistent across the, the three different conditions, approaching the mirror, consuming the prey with, and then without the predator. Uh, and then the ones that were slower to do any of these behaviors were slow across the conditions. One of the things that um, is pretty interesting to me or kind of revealing is some of these turtles are showing variation within their own tests. If you look at turtle number four, for example, this turtle was, was uh, pretty rapid to approach the mirror, uh, went to consume food without a predator pretty quickly, but when the raccoon was there, it was much slower to approach. I have a good feeling about turtle number four. And then component number two, which was uh, the open field test only uh, variables, shows that there may be variation in activity levels or exploration. We do see that animals that spend higher percentage of time either investigating or exploring within the open field uh, had a much shorter latency to exit their hide. So, so that, that does tell us that there is uh, potentially something going on. Now, since I'm only sharing some preliminary results with you, uh, we believe that we will be able to identify additional factors as we finish our analyses. But I do want to show you a brief video that is the response of four different turtles to the mirror test. And it will clearly demonstrate that, although we don't have all of the data yet, a turtle is not a turtle is not a turtle. They all react very, very differently. Um, we did get the permission of each turtle to do a voiceover since they, um, they didn't talk during this, so I'm, I'll be narrating. So this first turtle is, is what I call the drive-by. Hi. OK, see you later. This, this turtle is making its new best friend. Very fascinated. Doesn't want to leave. It's giving kisses. Some turtles, a little reluctant to make a new friend. Not really quite sure, maybe another day. And then some turtles, very insistent in their response. Oh yeah. <laughs> so as you can see, there really are some clearly discernible differences in their behavioral responses to a simple test. And we look forward to seeing what emerges from all of this. So what's next for us? 
as I mentioned, we are in the process of coding the remaining videos, and uh, that will lend some, some better uh, efficiency with our PCA analysis with the increase in sample size to the full 24 turtles. And then we're also going to evaluate the stability of these responses over the, the replicates, the, the three additional, uh, or the two additional testing days, and assess for any evidence of habituation to the tests as well. Now, the University of Michigan Flint researchers are tracking the turtles over the next year. They will share the results with us. Uh, one of the things that everyone, I'm sure, will be relieved to know, everyone's still alive. So that's great. Uh, and many have actually uh, entered their dormant period for the winter, as it is a little bit cold now. So is this the future for turtles? If we can actually link survival of turtles with specific personality types, we can then use these sorts of tests prior to release to determine which individuals may be best suited for release into specific types of habitats, for example. But if that's the case, is there an implication for the population? If we are releasing specific personality types in specific areas, are we sort of stacking the deck? Is it possible that um, if individual turtles stay close to their release area, could we be um, having a bias in the population towards a certain type of personality, there is some heritability factor to personality, and we could therefore have that as an impact. What if there were a sudden change in the environment and the predominant personality type was no longer well-suited? The good news is that uh, even though personality traits can somewhat constrict behavioral responses, there is plasticity within um, individual, uh, individuals' responses to, to uh, conditions. So, so that is good news for turtles, good news for, for any creature, if you will, because even though we may have a certain personality type, we may be really, really shy and therefore nervous when we're speaking in front of people, uh, we can adapt if we uh, need to. My end uh, message is that we need more personality re uh, research in zoos and aquariums, certainly, because not only can it expand the knowledge base of personality in animals, but it can really greatly increase the contribution that zoos and aquariums make to compassionate conservation and has other welfare implications for animals in our care, including looking at breeding success, looking how they cope with stressors, and, uh, and, and including things like transport stress. There are a lot of different applications that we could uh, really utilize this research for, and, and I encourage anyone who's interested to, to get involved in this, in this type of work and support it in, in your institutions. And with that, I thank all of you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, throughout the morning, I'm becoming uh, less and less optimistic. I, I've just experienced a great personal stress. I'm from Buffalo, so I had five feet of snow. I woke up this morning feeling gloomy, so my personality is wrong. And when I was off stage, I saw a toy raccoon, and it almost scared me to death. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, uh, I better check my health shortly. But, but anyway, having said that, what is uh, Ron Kagan? So I know we have um, th this session this morning has been quite a bit about personality. Um, and I know we have a couple of people here from Guelph, one who has already spoken. Uh, uh, Georgia, who, who is also on our advisory uh, board of the Center for Zoo Animal Welfare, has been working for some time. And I don't know whether, Stephanie, this is for you or for the folks from Guelph to answer. Uh, but this issue of, of whether um, the personality of individuals or indeed uh, the kind of personalities of a particular species, the generic personality, if you will, whether that can help zoos in terms of the selection of what species they care for. Um, I know there's been some work done on exotic cats uh, suggesting that perhaps ones which are uh, less timid might thrive better in captive environments. So I, I'm curious whether you or, or some, someone from Guelph would like to sort of share a little bit about that work. I would say that there are definite applications for, for utilizing personality research in that way. Um, I, as far as some of the work that's been done, I'm not sure Mike or I'm not sure where Heather is in the audience, if, if either one of you have anything more to add to that. Um, but, but I do think certainly that that is a way in which we could make some of these types of decisions for the animals that should be within our populations, depending on, on how well they can adjust to different constraints, constraints placed on them uh, from, from living in a captive setting. And I open it up to either one of you if you, if you have a, additional comments on that. 
Yes. I think that one of the things to remember about personality is that it's about variation. And when we start to build populations, we should make sure to manage and maintain that variation. And actually, we're pretty good at that probably in zoos because we do a, our best to relax selection, which should allow for the expression of as many personalities as exist. Given that, what we should probably think about is the placement of individuals of different personalities into positions where they're actually going to be most effective and have the best possible welfare. The same situation isn't necessarily the same for each individual, but there should be in our, in our institutions places where each type of individual should be able to be successful. Okay, we only have a few minutes here, but did, did someone from Guelph want to, did, Michael, did you want to weigh in on Ron's question? You know, Georgia has suggested that there are certain personality types that really thrive in captivity, and maybe those are the ones that we kind of should be keeping because they're easier to manage and they do better. Um, but then, Stephanie, I was going to ask you, so is it the case then that those animals that, are, that do really well in captivity and maybe have, you know, these personality types, are those the same ones that we're then releasing? Or is this kind of the, a tension between which personality types do better where, and then how do you select, you know, for either one if they're kind of bridging the gap between those two areas? Well, I, I think if we're looking at using this as a tool to make decisions about how we're going to be working with different species, whether it's in a captive setting or, or for a reintroduction or, or a field setting, um, certainly those are, those are tough individual decisions to make. But I do think that the more information we have that can best enable us to make decisions that are, that are really taking the welfare of the individual animals and not just species because the, the welfare of, of animals is really an individual factor, that, that we have to, to make those decisions using that information if we have it. And, and the more we can understand, the better we can make those types of decisions. And I, I would say that that's something we should do. Okay, um, forgive me, uh, two, two questions here and then, yes please. And, these are, and then we'll end. Thank you. Um, uh, Stephanie, I mean, one of the issues with uh, selecting for personality traits is that it changes the species uh, dramatically, as we know from Belyov's experiment with the uh, foxes. I mean, they went from fo wild foxes to dogs. And, so, uh, and that was s selected solely on approach behavior. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to be careful about talking about, well, we'll, select, we'll just select for personality traits and we'll keep those animals. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Gordon. Uh, just quickly, you didn't mention sex at all in your, in your talk. And uh, we know that with our mitid turtle, there's variation within the sexes, within each species, but also uh, between the sexes. And that might also play into which animals might be surviving better. Maybe females with certain characteristics will survive better uh, than, than the males and, and vice versa. So did you see any sex differences in your, uh, uh, at all in your uh, surveys? We, we haven't looked at it in that way yet, but that is definitely something that we plan on doing, and we're, we're making a note of that right now. <laughs> One can imagine a whole series of studies evolving from this conversation uh, in which sex and prior experience and personality type, species type would all be variables.